I'd like to read, first of all, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 14. Proverbs, chapter 14, and verse 12. Proverbs 14 and verse 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And one more reading in the New Testament, please. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 13, <laughs> enter ye in at the straight gate, that is the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because narrow, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be. <coughs> that find it. These verses bring before us a profound concept that we would all do well to grasp. It is the picture of our, as human beings, our being travelers on a road. And of course, the road leads somewhere, travelers. Life is not static. We're all moving through this world. We are aware that our planet is moving that our galaxy is moving. Scientists tell us that the entire universe is moving. God tells us that our lives and our souls are moving and we are on the way to God's world, to another world, to an eternal world, to eternity. Now, this is something that we dare not ignore. Maybe it would have been wiser for me to try to speak on this at the beginning of the meetings, but it is so vital for you to stop tonight and ascertain just which road am I on? Where am I traveling? Where am I going? Because obviously the road you're on will determine where you will end, whether the road is the way of transgressors, which is hard, or whether it is the narrow way that leads to life. So I want you to think first of all about a road to fear, to fear this way of transgressors. The wise man tells us that it is, it is hard. First of all, it's unnatural. We think that the natural way to live is the way most people live. And the way most people live is to live without God. But that's not the natural way. I, I don't know if, if you were here last evening. I don't know what your reaction was when you heard my dear brother speak about the Ten Commandments and say that we were called on to love the Lord our God with all our mind and our heart and our soul and to serve him. I don't know if the first thought that would have come into your mind is, well, what about my life? What about how I want to live? But you see, God is the one who made us. And God made us to live knowing and serving him. That's the ultimate in life. Now, you can take a lawnmower, a riding lawnmower, and try and cross the Atlantic. But that's not going to work very well because that's not what it was made for. You will be as successful as taking a rowboat and trying to cut your lawn with that. It's not made for that. And you and I were not made to live on the broad way. We were not made to live as sinners. We were made to live knowing God, loving God, serving God. And sin has instead warped and distorted and ruined the human life. It's very short-sighted because on, on this way of transgressors, on this road, people just live for today. They're not looking ahead. They're not thinking ahead. They have... In many cases, they have shut out eternal realities. And instead of taking that long view and thinking about where am I going to be in eternity? Where am I going to be after I die? How can I be sure I will be in heaven? Instead of that, Peter described people who cannot see afar off. They're just occupied with the present, with the material, with the physical. There's a man in Luke chapter 16. We don't know his name, but we do know this about him. He fared sumptuously. He ate well every day, every day. There's a man a few chapters earlier, and we don't know his name, but we know this, that he was planning to live for many years. Neither of those two men understood how short their time was. The man who thought that, that he had many years to live was going to die that night. The man who was faring sumptuously every day came to the border of eternity, crossed it, went into eternity, and his whole experience 
was the, the exact opposite of all the opulence and luxury and comfort and wealth that he had enjoyed in life. And yet while he was living, apparently, if we take the language of the farmer in Luke 12, there wasn't a thought about eternity or where he would be after he died. Do you remember how that woke up the dying malefactor? I know I have no idea whether the malefactor ever heard about the Lord Jesus before, ever heard the gospel, or even ever thought about where he would be when he would die. He certainly joins in with the crowd and with the other malefactor in mocking the Lord Jesus, but there comes a point where that man realizes he is on the edge of eternity. He is about to step out to meet God, and his whole thinking changed as he realized he was not ready. Now, when the writer says the way of transgressors is hard, he's reminding us how hazardous, hazardous, dangerous this road is to us. Sin has affected your life. You may be the finest boy in your school class. You may be the nicest person on your block or in your whole town, but sin has affected every one of us. And the pictures that the Lord Jesus gave us are very graphic in conveying to us how ruinous sin is. He told us about an heir, an heir to his father's fortune, ending up feeding pigs. He's reminding us how debasing sin is to take this boy from here and bring him all the way down to there. On another occasion, the Lord Jesus told us about travelers on the road and the man is overwhelmed by robbers and he is left half dead and they have taken everything from him. And he is reminding us how deadly sin is. This is what sin has done to us. This is what sin has done to you. This is why you need the remedy for sin. I, I'm ashamed to tell you that despite all the gospel preaching that I heard, I never made the connection until the night I was saved. I never made the connection between my needing to be saved and my being a sinner. Those two things never seem to come together in my mind. In fact, to be honest with you, there were times when I imagined that when God said that we had to be saved, it was just something he had arbitrarily picked that he could have said anything. He could, have, he could have said that you need to go to Jerusalem. He could have said that you need to pay so much money. But for some reason, he selected this and said, you need to be saved. And I never came to understand that why salvation was an absolute necessity was because of my sins. They had shut heaven to me. My sins would have banished me into the lake of fire forever. That is why I needed to be saved. And the Lord Jesus wants you to understand how dreadfully serious sin is, how terribly lethal and deadly it is, and why you so much need to be saved. Back in the year 2013, there was a security guard on the island of Bali. He was actually in a restaurant, so I don't think he was on duty, but outside of uh, the Bali Hyatt Hotel, he had heard somehow that there was a 15-foot-long python. It was right out there in the open. This was at 3 a.m. in the morning. And he thought, I'll go and help. Across the street from the restaurant, saw the python, grabbed its head, grabbed its tail. So far, so good. And then he put it on his shoulders. And within seconds, that python had wrapped itself around him and crushed him to death. Here's what one of the bystanders said. It happened so fast. We were sad because we, 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 we couldn't do anything to help him. It happened so fast. You see, when he grabbed it, see, while the words may not have materialized in his brain, when he, when he grabbed it, his thinking was, I've got this now. I've got it under control. I'm okay. See, I can handle this. And did not realize that what he was handling was going to kill him. And it may be that you can see other people and you think of the sins they have committed and what they have done, how they're living. And you think to yourself, I will never be like that. I, will, I have never done those sins and I won't do those sins. Nobody has ever handled sin. Nobody, no human, no mortal has ever beat it. Either you'll be saved from it by the Lord Jesus or it will kill you. 
and land your soul forever in a burning lake. Cut off from God eternally. That's how serious this is. It is a road to fear. If that's the road you're traveling tonight, then I, with all my heart, I would call on you to fear it because the end of this road is eternal destruction. I don't think you can do this anymore. If it ever opens up again, I would strongly urge you to visit Ellis Island. We wanted to see the names, the name of my, one of my grandparents on the wall. My sister and I went. And when you're inside the building, what you will find out is that at the far end, there's a flight of stairs going down. And in the middle of the flight of stairs, there is a railing. And those stairs were called the stairway of separation. Here's why. If you passed the tests medically and you were allowed to stay in the United States, you went down one side. If you were ill, if you, if you were sick, if, if you were going to be sent back where you came from, you went down the other side. Yeah, there's a man right there at the desk. Check your papers. This way, sir, please. Yeah, just, just go down this way. Those who went down this way, see, they stepped out onto the island, getting transportation, heading to the United States. Those who went down this way ended up in a large holding room and eventually, we, eventually would be placed back on a ship to go back wherever they came from. And so there was this separation if you would like to know an interesting thing about the green family sister martha's sister priscilla told me that when the family came over here they were all checked medically to see if they were all right but one of them was such a hale healthy looking fella that the the uh, inspector said well there's no need to check you had they checked him He'd have been on the boat to go home because the hale, healthy looking one was sick. You may look hale and healthy tonight. You may feel you're all right. You don't have a lot of sins. You're okay. God looks at your heart and God wants you to understand how deadly, destructive, lethal sin is. Through this life, the way of transgressors is hard. It ends. It ends in an eternal nightmare in hell and the lake of fire. So did you notice that when the Lord Jesus described the narrow way, he tells us about a road to find. Finding the narrow way. Sadly, we need to find it because we are not automatically on it. So if your thinking is that you have always loved God, you can't remember a time when you didn't believe the Bible and therefore you must be on the way to heaven. Please understand that the narrow way has to be found. Everybody who is on the way to heaven has a moment in her life or his life where that person found out that he or she was not on the road to heaven, that that person was lost, that that person needed to be saved. This road has to be found, which is why the Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. This is why the Lord Jesus said, strive to enter in at that narrow gate, because this way has to be found. We were just speaking earlier this week, yesterday, in fact, about Mr. Jim Wamsley, the missionary to Venezuela. He was working in an office alongside of a young woman named Sally, and the boss uh, came in and said, look, anybody calls, I don't want to be bothered. Tell them I'm out. He went back into his office. A few minutes, the phone rang. So all Jim sees is that Sally picks up the phone. Yes. Hold on a minute. Jim, you're going to have to handle this to Mr. Wamsley. What? You're going to have to handle this. So he takes the phone. Hello? Yes. Uh, can, you, can you connect me through to the boss? Now, he's not in right now. Can I take a message? Yes, and gives the message and he hangs up. What are you doing? The boss said, just to say we're not, we're not home. But he's not here, not in. Jim, she said, I'm a Christian. I'm not, I'm not going to lie for anybody. You know what he said? 
I'm a Christian too. I'm a Christian too. She did a very wise thing. She just grabbed a piece of paper and a pencil or pen. And she drew the two roads. And she explained to him, Jim, I was born on this road. And there had to be a moment in my life when I got onto the narrow way. Do you have a moment like that? She asked him. No, he didn't have a moment like that. Eventually, he heard the gospel from her and others and was saved. By the way, he ended up marrying her. But he said to her, I'm a Christian too. Because he imagined that he was on the way to heaven when he was not. Have you found a narrow way? Have you found a narrow way? Is there a moment in your life you can look back to it and say that, that was the meeting? Yes, that was the message. That was the that was the moment. There, there it was. I was, I was, I was driving home. I was, I was in my house. I was in a gospel meeting. I was at a conference, wherever it was. Do you have a moment when you found the narrow way? When you stepped through the door and you entered onto the narrow way? Incredibly, we can find it because the Lord Jesus came to open up that way to God. Just let me give you three quick pictures from the Bible. I'll just, just go to the first three books of our Bible. Do you remember the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned and God drove them out of the garden and he placed a cherub with a flaming sword to guard the way to the tree of life. Now that was a twofold purpose. It was not only making sure that sinful man would not get back into the garden, but it was guarding the way because God had promised that there would be a way back. And that would happen when the Lord Jesus came, who would open up the way back to God. How would he do it? How would he open up that way back? Sin had put us outside of paradise. We all live and grow up and, and exist in a world that is plagued by the thorns and thistles of sin. How would we ever get back into paradise? That flaming sword. Would one day be in the hand of God and it would smite the shepherd hanging on the middle cross to open up the way back to God so that those who had strayed from him smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. I will turn my hands on the little ones. It's God opening up the way through Christ so that you could be brought back to him. Look at the second book of our Bible, Exodus. Because they had been, the Israelites had been redeemed from Egypt, but do you remember when they were caught? In front of them is water, the Red Sea. Behind them are the Egyptians and their armies coming after them. And they cried out for fear. And what did God do? God opened up a way through the waters, carved a pathway on dry land, separating the waters. They congealed, is how they used, how they described it in their singing in the next chapter. He hung the walls on either side. And Israelis poured down into the open pathway and they walked across. And the book that records that is called the Exodus. And the word is used to describe the going out from the land of Egypt. And then you come to the New Testament. And on an unforgettable day, there's a man who thinned the veil of his humanity for just a moment. And his kingly glories shone out. And from heaven, two visitors came, Moses and Elias. And what they discussed on the Mount of Transfiguration is what heaven was all occupied with, what heaven was discussing. You know what they talked about? His exodus. His exodus that he would accomplish at Jerusalem. He was opening up a way for perishing sinners to reach heaven and God, to be saved. At the moment that a person trusts him, he is redeemed and he's placed on this narrow way that leads to heaven. Think about the third book of our Bible, Leviticus, and think about the significance of that veil hanging. So that nobody but one man, a high priest, could go inside that veil. And even the high priest could only do it one day of the year. And even on that one day of the year, when he would go in a number of times, he must always go in with blood. Some have even suggested that instead of parting the veil that he be down on his hands and knees putting the the scepter in with the incense going in underneath the veil sprinkling the blood before and on the mercy seat 
because the way into the presence of God was restricted. Speak, speak to Aaron, God said, and his sons, that he come not at all times within the veil. And then at Calvary. The way the writer of the Hebrews puts it is the wounding of the Son of God on that cross ripped the veil apart and provided a way to God and to heaven. He has opened up this way for you. You could step into it tonight. If you think salvation is complex, then just listen to this simple statement. I am the door. By me, if anyone enter in, he shall be saved. You can enter in tonight, thankfully. Thankfully, we will find it in the Bible, this way and how to be saved. Because God has made it so clear in his word, just as I've told you. There's a man who used to preach the gospel frequently in our area in southern New Jersey. One of the verses that he loved to quote is the it's from Isaiah, and it's that a wayfaring man, even if he is a fool, would not err therein, would not make a mistake. That salvation was so simple, he was saying, that the simplest person who will listen to God can be saved. Will you listen to God tonight? Will you listen to God tonight? Because this way is distinct from all other ways. I read to you, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end, the rubber, the ways of death. This way is distinct from all human thinking principles and theories about how to get to heaven. It's the way God has opened up for you. This way will lead you to God and to heaven. If you will trust Christ tonight. Now, it may be that you have often listened to the gospel in the past. Will you listen tonight? Will you listen tonight as my dear brother preaches it to try to find out how you can get on that way, how you can be saved? Nobody becomes a Christian by deciding that she or he wants to be saved. But I'm not so sure that anybody ever gets salvation until they decide that that's what they want. So I'd just like to ask you right now as I sit down. Do you want to be saved tonight? Here, now, in this tent, do you want to be saved tonight? And if you do, you're going to hear further how you can step through the door, step onto that way. And instead of traveling the way of transgressors, which is hard You'll be on the narrow way that leads to life and home and heaven with God forever. Book of Acts, please, in chapter 28. Book of Acts in chapter 28. <clears throat> Read at the end of the chapter, verse number 30. Acts 28 and verse 30. <clears throat> and Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And over to the gospel of Luke and chapter 23. <clears throat> Luke 23 and verse 33. <laughs> And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, <clears throat> one on the right hand and the other on the left. And drop down to verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened. 
and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. <clears throat> that is all we will read. You have heard about two ways, <clears throat> and my brother closed with the question, if there was anybody who desired to leave the way of transgressors, the way of sinners, and be on the way to heaven. And I want you to focus your attention for the last part of this meeting on a man who did just that, who left the hard way of transgressors, the hard way that was going down. He left it at the very last minute, at the very last second. But thank God he left it and he left for the other way. We read in the book of Acts, chapter 28, just at the end of the book of Acts, it ends very strangely in a sense. Here's the Apostle Paul, the great missionary. He's gone all over the world, really. He's pressed himself to go all over to see uh, people saved and to see uh, churches planted. And now he's locked down in his own hired house and he's not able to get out. And yet he's not at all discouraged or diminished. It says that he's receiving all kinds of people into his house. And this is what it says. He preaches the gospel of the kingdom. He preaches the kingdom of Jesus Christ to all who come in. <clears throat> I think it would be without exaggeration if I told you that the major promise in your Old Testament is all about God setting up a kingdom. All of the prophecies center on this, that while there are nations that rise and Babylon rose, and Egypt rose before that, and different nations have risen before that. Rome rose in the life of Christ. Greece. Today, there are many nations that, that strive to be world powers and, and, and um, maintain influence in the whole world. But really, there is one who sits on the throne today. It says that he rules over the kingdoms of the world and establishes over them whomsoever he will, even the basest of men. He is the king over all the nations. And one day, this man, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, rose again. He is going to come and rule over this entire world. And the hope we could be only seven years away from when Jesus Christ himself will rule over the entire world. He won't just rule over a part of it. Everyone in the world will be under his rule. And this is a kingdom that is going to be marked by righteousness. Nothing, sh nothing shady. Nothing done in the shadows, no bribes accepted, no, no passing over justice. Everything will be right, and it will be a kingdom of peace. There will be no wars. There will be no strife. He will rule in absolute peace over this world. And the apostle Paul and others before him, John the Baptist and others all the way through, preached that there is a kingdom that's coming, a kingdom. And you see, all of us here today, I myself am a citizen of the United States of America. And maybe there's most of you here who would be the same. But really, every Christian here today is a citizen of heaven. And this audience tonight is divided in those who are citizens of heaven and those who are still in the kingdom of darkness, not citizens of heaven. In fact, is there was a man who was a, a missionary and he went over to Romania with his family, his daughter and his wife. And uh, he was warned that when the security guards, this is now a number of years ago, uh, at least 50 years ago, <clears throat> when the security guards would search you, you could be in, a, be in for a lot of trouble, a lot of hassle. And sure enough, as he got on the train and crossed over, as he was over there in the Czech area and he went into Romania, one of the security guards asked him, I need to see everything that's in your bags. In a very broken English, very forcefully asked him. And so his wife emptied out all her bags and so did he and so did the daughter and he's searching through them. And he noticed that his, his wife, he noticed that the, the, the woman, she had a brown paper bag tucked right to her chest. And he said, what is that? And she rather sheepishly took it out and it was a Bible. Back then, illegal in that part of the world. And they knew they were in for big trouble. And the man, he took the Bible and he leafed through it. And he opened it to Philippians 3. And he said, you are not Americans. And they looked at him. Like, and he said, and I am not Romanian. He said, we are citizens of heaven. Philippians 3. <laughs> and into Romania came this missionary couple to spread the gospel. You see, my friend, in this tent tonight, right here, I want to ask you, are you a citizen of heaven? Are you on your way to heaven? 
is your citizenship. Do you have citizenship rights with heaven? Has the king granted you those rights, the Lord Jesus? Do you know him? Do you know a personal relationship with him? We're not asking if you are a good standing member in a church. We're not asking if you've been baptized. We're not asking, you know, if you pray every day. We're asking, do you know Christ? Are you a citizen of heaven? Do you know heaven as your home? Whether America crumbles or whether they rise out of the whole thing. Are you a citizen of heaven? And that's what Paul was preaching. And here was a man. And the reason I, I thought about this second criminal is because he used that expression. He said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. <clears throat> I just want to go through the story very briefly uh, of this man, this second criminal. You know, <clears throat> the Lord Jesus, when he came into this world, it says that he was born a king. A king. And yet, uh, if you were to look at him, and as many looked at him in that day, you would not think that he was a king. He was not born to one of the Herods. He was not born to Pilate and or Pilate's family. He was not born in Caesar's household. He was born to a teenage family an abject poverty in a tiny little town where the where where he grew up. The idea was, can anything good come out of that place? He did not come with the royal badge. Some of you here today. If I can be as bold as to say some of you ladies, you probably every time there's a royal baby born or a royal wedding, you get all into it. That's all right. You know, when the Lord Jesus came into this world, there was no fuss made really about him. There was no great parades that were run and everyone looking for Christ. Just a few wise men, just a few who were led by God to find this child born in poverty. The king of the universe, more important than any royal that has ever been born. God himself into our world and not a parade was held for him. Not a great television spotlight for Christ. Poverty, swaddling clothes, no room in the end. The king, the king, the coming king, the king who was going to rule. He came in such a, a poor way. He lived and he had no entourage, no great uh, military around him. Just a few fishermen, just a few tax collectors. Just a few prostitute women followed by the very poorest and meager people of society. The king of, of all the ages was here on this earth. And so you can see he didn't really look like a king. He didn't look like a king to the people of that day. He looked like a, just another normal poor man from Nazareth. Until he spoke. We have just read something taken out of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, after being baptized, after the spirit descended on him like a dove, he opened his mouth and he began to speak. And he began to outline the program of the kingdom found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And as he began to speak, this poor village carpenter, this man, and they wondered, where does he get his learning from? At the end, my brother has just finished just at the end of that sermon, where he points them to two ways. And at the end, all of them who are listening, said this, he speaks as one who has authority. You know why? The king was here. The king. He had authority as he spoke. He was telling people the way that his, his kingdom, the way it would function. It would be a kingdom of righteousness. It would be a kingdom of peace. It would be a kingdom where the standard was more than the scribes and the Pharisees. It would be a kingdom, Matthew 6, that has no hypocrisy. It would be a kingdom that sought first the kingdom of God. It would be a kingdom that was marked by righteous judgment. As he moves everywhere through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, they couldn't help but say, that man, he's not speaking like an expert teacher trained in one of the synagogues. He's speaking like someone else, the king. And then he showed he was the king by the deeds he did. When he told a stormy sea to just be quiet, shh, and it went to sleep. When he raised the dead to life, when he told the lame to walk, when he gave the blind their sight, you know why? The kingdom was here. That's why the people who were around when Jesus was preaching, John the Baptist, he said, the kingdom is near. It's near. You know why it was near? The king was here. That's why it was near. 
And yet you say, but we've read some very strange words here in Luke 23. When they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. You know, the big question in New Testament evangelism is if Jesus was the king, what is a king doing on a cross? What is the king doing on a cross? The cross was a place where you met defeat. The cross was a place of tremendous shame. The cross in that day was like a swear word. It wasn't something you would glory in. It would be like walking up to a Jewish person today and glorying or celebrating or laughing about Auschwitz. You would never do that, nor would you ever do that when it came to a cross. It was a hideous place, a place to run 180 degrees away from. And here is the king on the cross. And so he doesn't look like a king. He looks like somebody who has been a false prophet, somebody who made a bunch of false claims. And there he is on the cross. And so you know what happened as he's put on the cross? As nails are driven through his hands, through his feet, as they mocked his kingship just before he went there, they crowned him with thorns and beat it into his head. They put a purple robe on his back. And then all the soldiers got down and bowed before him. They said, oh, your kingdom's so strong. You know how strong it is? It's like a flimsy reed. Here you go, king. That's what they did to the king of the universe. And they bowed down before him, mocking him. And then they took off the purple robe and they led him out to the cross. And they nailed his hands and his feet to the cross, lifted him up between two criminals. And these two criminals, along with every single other person, really, on the other side of the cross, you know what they did? They started making fun of this supposed king. If you are the Christ, if you're truly the anointed king, you, a king on a cross, well, save yourself. Come down, king. Come down. We'll believe you. Come down. You're the king, right? And this criminal here that we've read about, another gospel will tell us this. He did the same thing. He was mocking the Lord Jesus. It says they both cast the same in his teeth. They mocked him. You're not the Christ. You're not the king. You're false. Now, let me ask you. If he is the king, and he is. Do you know what he's doing on the cross? Have you ever understood that? Like, could not could not he have just come and began to rule? Could not he have just come and crushed the little pawn that Caesar was? I was just reading today in Isaiah. It says that the king of the universe, the Lord, he sits over the circle of the earth. And all the inhabitants are like grasshoppers. We were today somewhere. We were looking down a little pot, a bunch of little worms. That's how God, just grasshoppers. Oh, they make different amounts of money. Oh, some have big houses, some small. Some have nice jobs, some not so nice. Graspers in the sin of God. Oh, and big Caesar, he looks so big and terrifying. Oh, the king, without even hardly saying a word, could have crushed the little Caesar. Just like he crushed Pharaoh. Just like he crushed Nebuchadnezzar. It would have taken nothing. So why didn't he? Why didn't he? Because if he established his kingdom, then we could never have been part of it. You and I would never have been welcome. You know why? We're sinners. We're sinners. His kingdom is going to be a kingdom of righteousness. His kingdom is going to be a, a kingdom where there is no sin. And if he would have established it right then, there would be no room in it for me. Because I'm a sinner. And my friend, there would be no room in it for you because you're a sinner. And so the reason he's going on the cross is, as you've heard so clearly today, through the ending of his own body on the cross, he is going to make a way for sinners to be part of his kingdom. For us to reign with the Lord Jesus Christ, to be with him while they're mocking him. The two criminals, they're making fun of him. I wonder today, have you ever made fun of Christianity? Have you ever made fun of Jesus Christ? You ever just thought, oh, that's just religion. Oh, those are holy rollers. 
You ever made fun of him? That's what these men were doing. They were mocking. They were mocking him, mocking his claims. But it was already referenced here in this meeting tonight. One of them, one of them stopped. And what stopped him? It says this. Do you not fear God? All of a sudden, all of a sudden, like that. There he is on on the cross, one on one side, one on the other, the Lord Jesus in the middle. He's making fun of him. Everyone else around the cross is making fun of him. And all of a sudden, he just stops. And what stopped him was the fear of God. My brother at the beginning of these meetings uh, used a phrase that I think is exactly what happened here. The inundation of the eternal. What does that mean? All of a sudden, the normal realities of earth that were taking place, people making fun of a criminal, a seeming criminal who was dying on the cross, everyone laughing at somebody who was being shamed by the Roman government. All of a sudden, he saw beyond it all. To a meeting he was about to have with God. And it stopped. The fear of God. Can I ask you? The question he asked the other criminal, do you fear God? Have you ever got beyond the white tent? Have you ever got beyond New Jersey? Have you ever stopped to think I, at any moment, through a fatal car accident, through an unfortunate death in in my sleep even, I could meet God. I could meet God. Have you ever stopped to think about your own criminal record and stop making fun of the gospel and stop saying, oh, it's just a distraction in my life. I'd like to get back to my sports. I'd like to get back to my summer vacation. I'd like to get back to my school. I'd like to get back to my friends. Has it occurred to you? God, God, I'm going to meet God. That's what happened to this man. It just gripped him. And I can tell you, that's what happened to me on the 22nd of March, 2003. It was, I don't remember anything else that happened in this world, nothing. I don't remember if there was a war announced. I don't remember if there was an economic downturn. I don't remember if I had homework the next day or a, or a sports game the next day. All I knew was this. I am, I am going to meet God and I'm not ready. And all I remember at the end of that night is I'm saved and I'm ready. And I don't remember anything else about that week. Nothing. You know why? Because it became the most vital thing in my life. And that's what has to happen to you. That's what has to happen. All of a sudden he stopped. By the fear of God, the fear of meeting God on the wrong way of meeting God in sin. And then he turns to this man. Now, I just want you to try to imagine. I know some of you have heard the story so many times. This very familiar story preached in gospel meetings. I want you to try to imagine. Here's a man on the middle cross who has never sinned. He has never done one thing wrong. He is silent through his entire trial. Then when he's lifted up on the cross and when every word becomes painful beyond description, he begins to speak. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. And this criminal is making fun of him along with this one. All of a sudden, this one, he realizes he is hours from meeting God in his sins. That not only the crimes he's done against the Romans are being judged for through crucifixion, but there is somebody beyond Roman government that he's going to meet and face the judgment for what he has done. And this man who's mocking Jesus all of a sudden turns to him and says, Lord, remember me. He turns to Jesus and says, basically, have mercy on me. Think of me when you come into your kingdom. Now, if that was you on the middle cross. If that was you, unbelievable pain. On top of that, the mocking of this man. And all of a sudden, yeah, he's had a change of heart. And now he wants your mercy and your pity. What would you do? What would I do? I can tell you what the Lord Jesus did. The same thing he would do for you tonight. Though you've rejected him many times, friends. He turned to that man and he said, today. Today, you will be with me 
in paradise today. You see, the Lord Jesus will turn no one away who comes to him. Here's a man and he's made fun of him. But yet this man, likely a Jewish man, because Romans could not be crucified, likely a Jewish criminal. He grew up going to Sunday school, Saturday school, I suppose. And he, and he heard much of the Bible. He knew a lot of the verses in the Bible. He knew all about Moses that you've heard of today, all about the Exodus. And here he is, and he understands this. Look at what he says. He said, I'm getting what I deserve. I'm receiving justly the rewards of my own sin. So he understands that I'm getting what I deserve. And then he understands that the man on the middle cross has done nothing wrong. So here he is suffering for his sin, going out into an eternity where he will continue to suffer for his sin. And here's a man, the spotless son of God, no sin, no fault. And he looks at him and he says, he's done nothing out of place. And all of a sudden it clicks. If he's not there for his sin, perhaps a verse from Isaiah 53 came into his mind. He's being wounded for mine. He's being crushed for mine. I'm the sheep that goes astray. I turn my own way. Murder, robbery. But the Lord is laying on him the sin of us all. He's the one crying out, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? This thief isn't crying that out. Nor is this thief, just the sinless man in the middle. Why am I abandoned? And this criminal understands, it's for me. You notice that? He says, Lord, remember me. Me. That's where every sinner has to come to. Not my family. Not, 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 not my friends. Me. Salvation is an individual thing. It is you understanding this, that your sin will lead you to hell. Justly. We indeed justly. We're getting, we, we deserve that. But here's one, and he's being punished, who never deserved to. And according to the Bible, he's being punished to take what we deserved. He's being punished in the stead of the ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. He was the just for us, the unjust. He's doing it for us. And I can tell you. On that March day, I understood he's doing it for me. As if I was the only sinner on planet Earth, he would have come all the way from heaven to hang between two criminals and all that shame just for me. Why? So I could be with him in this kingdom that is soon to come on this earth. And so he cries out for mercy. Maybe I should just emphasize that point. You know, I like this uh, the story of the thief. Because there he is, nails in his hands and feet. Is, is there anything he can do with his hands? Anything he can turn to Jesus and say, I'm going to pay you this much. I'm going to give you this much. I, I, no, his hands, are, his hands are bound. Nothing he can do with his hands. What about his feet? I, I'll go to Jerusalem for you. No, his, his feet are bound too. He's just back. There's nothing he can do. The only thing he can do is cry out. <laughs> And that's a great place to be when a sinner understands there's nothing I can do. I can't go anywhere for him to merit his salvation. I can't do anything for him. All I can do is fall on his mercy, like Bartimaeus, like so many others in, in the life of Christ, and just cry out, Lord, remember me. And he understood this, that this isn't the end of Jesus of Nazareth. He's not just here on the cross dying for sin. He said, you're coming into your kingdom. This man, this criminal understood this. If the prophecies, if the prophecies are true, this sinless man who dies for sin will rise again and will establish and inaugurate a true kingdom. And he's coming, sorry, he's coming in to his kingdom where he will reign. And he said, Lord, remember me. I wonder if there's anyone here in this tent tonight. There's anyone. And you just look at Calvary and you say, is there anything in that for me? anything. If you will turn, turn from mocking Christ or turn from thinking little of him, turn and understanding that for your sin, you're going to have to give an account to a holy God. And I can tell you what he will do for you. If you're in your sin, he will judge your sin and sentence you to hell. That's what the Bible says. 
And all the while, it's not necessary because Christ died for our sin and bore the judgment. And all the person has to do is turn to him and they will be saved. The last part <clears throat> touches me. You see, I believe that the moment that criminal turned to Christ and placed faith in Christ, that man was saved. The moment he said, remember me, he was saved. He was going to be with Christ. And yet the Lord Jesus turns to him. Every breath is painful. Every breath is pushing up against the nails. And he assures that man. Today, you will be with me in paradise. He assures him. And that just tells me this. God will never save a person without making sure that they know it. Do you know it? Do you know it? He will never save a person without giving them ample proof so that they can know it. Now, let me ask you here tonight. Where is that criminal? Where is that thief? Where is he today? He said, well, you read it in the Bible. He's in paradise. That's right. How do you know? He said, because Jesus said that's where he will be. That's right. You know how I know I'll be in heaven? Because the Bible says, he that has the son has life. The Bible says Christ died for the ungodly. That was me. And the same reason you know that the thief is going to heaven, you can know that I'm going. I'm depending on the same word. And just as I close, I will just ask you to remember this. There were two criminals there. There were two. According to the scripture, <clears throat> both were the same distance from Christ. It says on either side, one, Jesus in the midst, in the middle. Both the same distance from Christ to be saved. No one had an advantage. No one was a little bit closer. One turns. Trust Christ. He's in paradise. I'm going to meet him one day. I'm going to meet him. He won't have any answers when I say, where did you get baptized? He won't, he won't have anything. Never got baptized. Which church were you a part of? Won't have anything to say about that. How many Bible verses did you memorize? Won't have too much about that. You know what he'll say? There was a man on the middle cross and he said, I could be here. He saved me and I'm here because of him. But then there's the other one who never trusted Christ. Is there anyone in this tent who will meet him? You planning on meeting the other criminal? Who never turned to Christ, who never repented? Who never left the hard way. Where is he tonight? You think about that. All the while, I'm glad to tell you that still today, there is opportunity for you to trust Christ. It's very simple. This man did it in the last moments of his life. Lord, remember me. He was saved. If you from your heart tonight fall on Christ for mercy, he would save you tonight. In the seat you sit, we just pray that you would do that.